old half moon theatre over there. Now a Weatherspoons. So our adventure today actually starts by turning off the Mile End Road into White Horse Lane. White Horse Lane was the principal street in the old medieval village of Stepney, Stibbon Hyde it was in Anglo-Saxon times. So it's an ancient settlement, uh, an Anglo-Saxon settlement formed in marshy ground, which is an incredible thought when you think, you know, we're a couple of miles from the Thames here. We had rivers running down through here. I walked one of them with Tom Bolton, the Black Ditch, with sort of all sorts of stories associated with it, including the idea that Stibber, who founded Stibber and Hyde, actually sailed up the Black Ditch to found his settlement here in Stepney. But that isn't what today's video is really about. Today's video, we're doing some of the buildings in here, this wonderful book by Ian Nairn, Modern Buildings in London, published in 1964 by London Transport, would you believe? and republished here in this beautiful edition by uh, Notting Hill Press, or Notting Hill Editions, I think they're called, with an introduction by the brilliant Travis Elbra. But we'll talk more about that down here. And although the, the village of Stepney was first established in the Anglo-Saxon period and further sort of, I suppose, expanded a little bit in the Middle Ages around the Church of St Dunstan's, which we'll see very shortly, it was mostly developed in the 19th century. This was fields until the 19th century, many of whom were owned by the Mercer's Company, and they started to build the houses and development here. The development, I guess, was particularly driven by the 19th century growth of the docks, not far away. Maybe it's because it's a sunny day, but you know, you can still see Sep Stepney retains a little bit of that kind of villagey feel to it, doesn't it? Our focus in this video really is in a, a sequence of buildings featured in Nairn's book, which he wrote about and critiqued, described, reviewed, if you like, in 1964, that are mostly around Poplar. From, uh, we're going to go from Commercial Road and then uh, taking a few other buildings up through the Lansbury Estate and around this area, around Poplar, it's really fascinating. And of course, this is now open house month, so it's a month for going out and exploring the wonderful architecture of London. And actually in the eyes of Nairn, maybe some of the not so wonderful <laughs> modern architecture of London. More of that later, more of that later. A lot to say about Ian Nairn. must pass through the grounds of St Dunstan's Church, once the heart of medieval Stepney, a real nodal point in the east end of London. St Dunstan's is known as the mother church of the east end. It is an amazing structure. I think it's also, I'm going to go off script a little bit, I think it's also known as the Siemens Church. I will verify that before I go on much more, but it was established. Well, there was a wooden church here, dating back to I don't know when, but in nine, around 952, when Dunstan, Bishop of London, before he had been canonized, beatified, canonized. I've talked about that before. I don't know what's the difference between the two. But anyway, before Dunstan had been sainted, he, he owned this manor here and he decided to build a proper stone church on the site of the old wooden church, the old Saxon wooden church. That stone church was mostly replaced in the 15th century. So this church here, apart from a few sort of Victorian enhancements, is that original 15th century church. Of course, not the oldest church in the East End. Dunstan, uh, Bishop of London, was canonised in, oh, off the top of my head, I think it's like 1020 something, 1029. It is a majestic, majestic church and a majestic, majestic churchyard. I visited here with Ian Sinclair actually accidentally when we were walking the London Overground and we stumbled upon here, went off piste. And Ian has a long history associated with St Dunstan's and I will drop a bit of that footage in here because who else better to talk about St Dunstan's Stepney than the great, wonderful Ian Sinclair. 
and this is St Dunstan's in the east in Stepney and it's nostalgic because this uh, was where I first really started to write about London because I was a gardener in 1974 just across the road there in St George's Fields and we used to cut the grass here but the Dunstan came here from Glastonbury where he'd been abbot and there's, there's a connection with alchemy Dunstan's associated with alchemy and for me it's the alchemy of the city and the fact that anyone born at sea is uh, officially attached to this church so it's a kind of uh, a very nice relation with the river and with um, the memory of uh, the older London when, when this would have been fairly remote and, and people like uh, Erasmus and Thomas More all visited as if, as if to a very quiet and calm country place. Not only was it a massive treat to actually go inside St Dunstan's, I was actually shown around by a lovely lady attached, or you know, a volunteer at the church who showed me around, was happy for me to shoot some video, told me about the history of the church and how actually most of it is the original stone medieval church built by Dunstan in 952, the central portion of the church. And she showed me where the exterior wall would have once been the little peek through that you could peek through into the church to see when the mass had started from the outside and actually so that central portion of the church the central set of archways that was originally the exterior wall of the church and it kind of cut across about halfway so it was possibly about half the length or maybe just over a third of the length of the church that it is today and it was just that central portion but that end of the church I don't know is it there with the bit where the vicar stands is that the nave that is the original stone church that Dunstan built in 952 and the later bits the most modern bits are well apart from the roof and some other bits of repairs but the rest of it was expanded in the 14th and 15th century so it's a really genuinely stone medieval church wonderful and that wonderful anglo-saxon cross there in the church and some other medieval carvings on the walls what an unbelievably tranquil and beautiful place and what lovely people there so that's made my day already and i've only just started and it, but isn't it great as well to start with a very old a 10th century stone building before we go and look at some post-war building so um, on to the next phase carried forth by st dunstan <laughs> some fine, I'd say the Victorian houses, aren't they? Fine Victorian terrace here. And this is Matlock Street. The looming towers of Canary Wharf. So this must have been the extension of St Dunstan's churchyard once it filled up. So this little churchyard here actually has nothing to do with St Dunstan's. It was the site of the first independent church in East London that was uh, founded in 1644 by a group of Puritans who called themselves the Independents. And Stepney was a real stronghold of the, uh, of the Puritans and the religious nonconformists around the time of the English Civil War and the Cromwell era. Fascinating little slice of history, this churchyard was established in um, 1779. Salmon Lane, another fine street here in Stepney. So we'll actually turn into Salmon Lane and then we can turn off here down towards Commercial Road and our first Ian Nen location. So we'll turn into Flamborough Street, where well, there would have been a pub on the corner there. And actually, if you look down Salmon Street, just on the next corner on the other side, there would have been a pub there as well. 
you can imagine what kind of street life around here in community life would have been like when those pubs on each street corner were still open. I bet people were desperately tribal about where they drank. We can imagine rolling out one of them <laughs> and into another. In fact, I think we have a pub open here. It's a good sign. So that's the Queen's Head, 1827 there on the, th and it looks like that's going strong. I can hear some great kind of ska music coming out of there. It's a fantastic sight to see. And you've got this wonderful little garden square here, York Square. And I think there's another pub on the other corner. The old East End is still alive and well if you just look for it hard enough. And there it is, the old ship. Again, like the pub on the other corner, doing a roaring trade on a Saturday afternoon at half past four. Brilliant to see. This is something you'd easily pass by. Flamborough Walk down here. I feel like I have to go and have a look. That is a little oasis back there. I didn't film because it's just like people sat outside their houses there, but some beautiful big houses down there. Also some little cottages. Got lovely little gardens there with vines growing. What a, what a walk of discoveries this has been. Look at all this here. We emerge from the peace and calm onto the commercial road built to link the old world, well, to link the old docks and the new docks together, carry all the road traffic, which would have been obviously horse and cart in those days, <laughs> and the people in this, what would have been a massively busy, bustling area. We're looking for our main location, which is a church. So at 649 Commercial Road, we have the Danish Siemens Church. Now it's the Husk Community Centre, but from Nan's description, this would appear to be the original building here. He says the thing that shines through is the humility and the professionalism, and that the building is as friendly as Denmark is itself. He really likes the building, and he says the V-shaped roof isn't just a gimmick, but to shine light upon the gallery. You can tell that he really liked this building. I think of all the buildings that he surveyed in his book, very few of them were by uh, non-British architects. This was one of the exceptions. So Ian Nairn, author of this book, Modern Buildings in London, with a wonderful new introduction by Travis Elbra. For me, in a lot of ways, Nairn is one of the godfathers of this activity that I do, particularly when I think about my new book, which will be published within a couple of weeks. Uh, welcome to New London. <laughs> but Nairn was kind of, a lot of the time, he was, uh, he was considered one of the angry young men in the 1950s, you know, the time of John Osborne and Look Back in Anger and all that, and he wrote an essay in the Architecture Review where he was really getting stuck into what he saw as the failings of modern post-war development and planning, where he said the end of Southampton starts to look like the beginning of Carlisle and the beginning of Carlisle starts to look like the end of Southampton and everything in between is a combination of the two. This kind of blandness that was enveloping Britain, particularly driven by road development, the coming of the road, because these new communities were suddenly not built around town centres anymore and local community shopping areas like we've seen around here, but built around increasingly out of town developments, out of town shopping, out of town housing, out of town uh, workplace, all of that. So he was railing against a lot of that. He came up with the term subtopia to describe this effect, and that made his name. I think it also, in a way, might be an example of somebody, it also was his undoing in the end. But he wrote this book, Modern Buildings in London for London Transport. I mean, that was, that was, that's obnoxious, isn't it? And actually, he wasn't overwhelmingly negative. I'd like the drivers on the road here beeping their horns. He wasn't overwhelmingly under negative. He was surprisingly optimistic about the future development of Britain, the future development of London. He saw hope in some modern architecture. And a lot of the stuff in this book, he is sort of pretty positive about. Some of it, he just says it depresses me and I can't write about it. So our next location, it's not that far away, up on Bow Common. Of course, the subtext of Nairn's book, published in 1964, is that a lot of the development that was taking place was being done on bomb sites, so it was post-war rebuilding. 
including some of the sites that we'll visit today, and you see lots of it around. Obviously, the docks are a major target. Looks like the fine old Limehouse District Public Library, the Passmore Edwards Public Library, is now a swanky looking hotel. Sailor's Mission here is a very fine building. Of course, it wouldn't have uh, counted as a modern building when Nairn was writing. And we're going to go beside the Sailor's Mission up Salmon Lane and turn into Copenhagen Place. Well, that's the plan anyway. some classic old industrial buildings. I guess they would have been light engineering once upon a time. No, I don't know what they are now. And the delivery driver's coming out of there, so it's something to do with food. These kind of industrial buildings are becoming a rarity in London these days. Where they survive, they've often survived as kind of like artist studios, but this still looks like it's industrial here. Another really lovely row of elegant Victorian houses here, what I'm guessing are Victorian anyway, just in Copenhagen Place, just before we reach our next Ian Nairn location. Looking across Bow Common, we're turning into Agnes Street and at the end of Agnes Street, Burdett Road, where our modern building awaits, possibly. Wow, here it is. This is a lot more imposing than I thought it would be. This is St Paul's Church here, which Nairn says is the only modern building by the Church of England in the London transport area that brings any credit upon the church, which he says is quite a damning indictment of the architecture of modern London from an ecclesiastical point of view. He calls it a, a compact, tough-minded cube of bricks in a tough-minded area, top lit there by that glass dome. On the entrance to it, it says, this is the gate of heaven, but the house of God. But the house of God, this is the gate of heaven. I'm not sure on the order. So the first two buildings have been churches, and before that, we had a medieval church, but there are no more churches, no more churches planned on this walk. Wow, there's a lot of noise, isn't there? Here's the Limehouse Cut. Our second canal of the day, isn't it? I walked along there recently with a wonderful sound recordist, Joel Carr, recording a podcast that hopefully you'll get to hear at some point once we've recorded a couple more. So we're going to briefly walk along East India Dock Road and we're looking for Pekin Street just up here on the left. Here it shows that we're at Lansbury West, the west side of the Lansbury Estate, I believe that means. But this isn't really the part that I was looking to focus on. It is mentioned in, it's one of our locations, it's one of Nairn's modern buildings in this part of East London, but it's not really this part that we're looking at. It's a, bit, a little bit further north. So we're in Canton Street here, and we're heading to Peking Street, and it, reflects the, uh, the Chinese population that settled here around the time of the docks. Obviously there was a lot of Chinese people associated with, with, uh, with sailing and with, uh, with seafaring, etc. And a lot of them settled around this part of the East End. And then so such wonderful things about Peking Street. I'm really intrigued to see what's here. One of the things that first stands out though, he says the trees will be lovely when they grow up. Or he says the street will be lovely when the trees grow up. And the trees have grown up and they are lovely. So these houses here, these two-storey houses were built in 1951 with a garden. And Nairn says this is what building for real people looks like. Not what 
politicians think people want is this. This is the model. And there are also some three-storey blocks of flats here, or masonettes. He was incredibly enthusiastic about this development here. You can see it's all built around this little square here, which I don't know if it was paved like this at the time it was built. It is actually so quiet here. It's really noticeable. This isn't in Nairn's book, or not featured in Nairn's book, but it's impossible to ignore. I think this is the church of the Lansbury estate. Could get that completely wrong, but it's a modern looking church, isn't it? Now we pretty much come out of the end of Peking Street and cross the road into Grundy Street for our next Nairn location. So the building that Nairn writes about is an L-shaped block of old people's homes on the corner of Grundy Street, but I don't think this is it because that does not look like it was built in 1951. I might be completely wrong, that looks a lot more modern though, doesn't it? And some of the buildings that Nairn has written about have been demolished. In fact, some of them have been, been demolished twice. It's, it's funny because I'm pretty sure I worked in a film in that building there. I mean, I worked in a film in an old people's home around here and I'm pretty sure it's that one because I remember there was an old fellow who used to escape all the time and run off down this street here. <laughs> of Grundy Street we come upon the Lansbury Estate, the final location in our Ian Nairn tour and it was built in 1951 as part of the Festival of Britain. It's an exhibition of living architecture, an example of how post-war Britain could be rebuilt. The Market Square here was the first pedestrianised shopping street in the whole of Britain and it was a template that was copied throughout the land subsequently. It's wonderful to see it still here. It was designed by the brilliant Frederick Gibbard, who of course did Harlow Newtown and a number of other really important modern buildings. You can see here that the, uh, in the name of the pub here, the link to the Festival of Britain lives on. Look, and you can see like this thing here with the flats built around uh, a market square and a parade of shops. There's something almost kind of like medieval about it, isn't it? Like a continental piazza. Really, really wonderful. It's a sort of centrepiece in many ways of the Lansbury Estate, which kind of sprawls from here. Brick clock tower there is one of the sort of listed features. It's in, you know, it's not in the greatest shape now, but it is a part of the square which is going to be preserved. They are redeveloping this area, and some of it will be preserved. The clock tower, I think, will be renovated. I don't know what else is being kept. Look, you've got Maureen's pie and mash and hot salt beef. What more can a person want? The estate and the, and the market square was this idea of creating a fully kind of cohesive community where everything would be here, the butchers, the bakers, not the candlestick makers, but you get what I mean, the shoe repairers, you've got your market, your fruit and veg, the school, the church, the library, the community centre, the pubs, of course, the cafes would all be within a self-contained area and the community would be kept together, like trying to uh, sort of like revive the idea of the old medieval villages of the East End. And it succeeded in many ways and it's seen as being a real symbol of kind of post-war urban renewal in Britain, which if you, it was very, you know, people were still living on rationing when this was built, there was rationing, there were bomb sites everywhere. So it was a real kind of a statement of optimism about the future. Nairn is less than completely sold on it. He's writing about 10, 12 years later when he says the festival of Britain seems more distant than the war. He praises some elements of it. I think he liked the market square. Other bits of it he said were a bit confused and it was already starting to look a bit tatty. I think it has still got a bit of its magic, particularly in this age of rampant private development purely for profit. A place like this, built for the people, really does still ring true. Its message is, is still really clear. And consequently, I think this is the perfect place to end this Nairn's walk around the modern buildings of London, East End Poplar edition. And what an amazing start to the walk with the, uh, with the wonderful St Dunstan's medieval Stepney through to Festival of Britain Poplar. 
Well, thank you for joining me on that modern London walk, modern buildings in London walk. And don't forget the book is here with an introduction by the wonderful Travis Elbra, friend of the channel. And uh, as well, as I always like to say, I look forward to seeing the next walk wherever that may be. The book is coming. The book is coming very soon.